Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Andrew Capodiecci. Andrew is the Director of Autonomy at NEA Systems, a company that specializes in off-road ground vehicles. Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Glad to be here. Glad to have you, buddy. Um, so we met a few weeks ago at a Pittsburgh Robotics Network event at Caterpillar. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I just thought your talk was interesting. Uh, you were on a panel and... Um, I don't know. You were just like the most technologically sophisticated person on it. And I was like, mm. this will be a fun person to interview. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you accepting my invitation. Mm -hmm. So uh, also like uh, a few episodes ago, we had Prague Batavia who founded the company Andrew works for. So yep. kind of full circle. hired me. Badass. Oh, sorry? I said badass. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a good dude. Yeah, that was uh, 10 years ago. Nice. Right out of the MRC program, which we also talked about. I, I went to school there, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. So what, what class would you have been then if you were 10 years I ago? I was the second class of the MRC program. So you were before me. Okay, mm -hmm. that's cool. Usually people, I, I mean, I was like the third or the fourth. So. Yep. Yeah, that yeah. was uh, 2013. Nice. Hagen Schempf was still involved. Yep, he was still involved when I was there, but I was his last batch. I think because of me, he retired. That makes sense. Me personally. Right. Yeah, yeah I think he told me that. Yeah. yeah. He emailed yeah. me afterwards. It's like that yep. Spencer guy, I just can't do it anymore. <laughs> yep. Yeah, Hagen is, is a great guy. And now Parag does the business course, which yep. Hagen used to do. I kind Parag. of feel like I got cheated not having Parag for my business teacher in that course because... He would have been a great dude yeah. to learn about robotic business from, given his yeah. achievements. Yeah, see, the advantage I have is I got to learn from Hagen, and then I got 10 years of experience working with Prague, so yeah. I got the best of those Did you worlds. get recruited out of the coursework, or did he... Well, I guess he wasn't teaching when you were there, so you would have just... Okay, that's interesting. Yep, yeah, so when I took the MRSD Masters, uh, it was one year of courses, and then a seven-month internship. Yeah. And that seven month internship I did with Naya, and I've been there ever since. That's cool. So, yeah, I've seen it grow. I was the, I believe, 13th employee. Oh, cool. And so now we're over 50. So it's pretty fun. That's awesome. Did you ever work anywhere else, or were you always at Naya for like your entire career? Pretty much Naya, yeah. I did uh, internships with General Motors uh, in college. So, between, I think, my junior and senior year, and then between senior of undergrad in grad school. That's pretty so I cool. did two rotations with General Motors. That was the OnStar advanced development team. Interesting. And so I did things like when a vehicle is coming within a geo-referenced point, automatically pull DTCs. What's a DTC? Diagnostic trouble code. What's a reference point in this context? Uh, a geo-referenced point. So Got it. So like, like literally a geolocation with some radius around it. So you get Why would you want area. trouble codes when you got to a certain area? So the idea was you were automating part of the process for service appointments. So, so the this, area is gonna be like a, a shop. Yeah, the mechanic, yeah. the service center, the dealer. Yep, so the second you come in within a few miles and they have uh, an itinerary of their scheduled appointments for the day, they know what car they're looking for. As you get to the building, it starts pulling all the DTCs from the car. And so the demonstration that we ran was I unplugged an oxygen sensor cool. from the vehicle. So the car got close. We pulled the DTCs. A report came up in my UI. And we said, oh, okay, so it looks like the oxygen sensor is malfunctioning. And so the person walks in, and the second they step out of the car, they say, okay, so we pulled your reports. Looks like there's a malfunctioning oxygen sensor. Uh, it's going to take us, you know, 30 minutes to look at that and we'll probably have to replace it. It'll cost about this much. Nice. And so it's really trying to automate a lot of the process. So that exposes the DCCs to your mechanic. So they've got yes. the UI. It's not yeah. the user. Like and it's they, not like on the user's cell phone, you get a push notification. Correct. Okay. Yeah. That's and cool. they are going to pull those anyway. That's done manually. Right? Yeah, when for they sure. Get the you car. plug into the OBD2 port. Yeah. 
Yeah, hit a button. Yep, yep. And then I did some stuff with uh, Bluetooth connectivity of the phone, and uh, there was a reminder as you started to drive, like, "Hey, your phone isn't here. Did you forget it?" Because nice. generally people have their phones with them. So, uh, just some cool projects like that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Actually, those are pretty neat to get to work on as an intern. That's like pretty advanced. Uh, when I was at Deep Local, I got to work on some cool projects. So I. Um, I got to work on a project for uh, Hallmark called the North Pole Communicator. Mm -hmm. That was a giant. Uh, so the North Pole Communicator was a toy that was like a microphone you could talk to Santa Claus on, <laughs> and um, you know it, it was this kind of stupid Hallmark injection molded toy. But um, the one we made was like a giant fiberglass one, and, and mm -hmm. the idea was just like a retail display. And then I got to work on a thing I can't talk about, and then I got to work on um, something called the Old Navy self vibration machine which was, um, it was Old Navy's 20th birthday, okay. um, meaning their anniversary. And um, they um, wanted something to signify that. So we brainstormed a bunch of ideas. Uh, I had this one that I liked for like a balloon that would inflate whenever you'd go in the store. Mm -hmm. And then it would pop and a bunch of stuff would fly out. But the one that won was, um, it was like a matrix of balloons um, on a billboard and they would inflate to various levels pneumatically, and you would create pixel art of a person's face. So oh, the wow. idea is that you send your selfie with yeah. hashtag selfiebration on like, yeah. you know, whatever social media, and um, our API would pull it, um, and then it would, um, you know, uh, rasterize it and then put it on this display. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. uh, and then there was like some kind of human in the loop, I think, mm -hmm. like behind yeah. the scenes. Those sort of projects are always fun where you've got the blend of technology and art. Yeah, that's that's all yeah. Deep Local did was yeah. technology and art. I think nice. they still do. Nice, but haven't haven't yeah. been there for like a decade. So. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I have to say my intern project at Nea was uh, way cooler. Um, and at the time, this was like twelve years ago. Uh, GM had some work in autonomous cars, and I knew that's the kind of thing that I wanted to work on. Um, and when I was an intern at GM, I asked if I could get involved and. They took me on a tour of the facility, but at that time it was a really small research lab and they had these vehicles that were these like egg-shaped pods. Oh, that's interesting. Two-seaters. Why would yeah. they do that, I wonder, at GM? Yeah, the, the idea was, I believe, that you would be uh, driving in these urban environments yeah. like, for just transport. So this uh, was a GM-like concept transport. vehicle transport. that they just never... Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Yep, some of the early stuff. So uh, for whatever reason, they didn't have a job opening or an internship slot that I could work at. Uh, and so, you know, they offered me kind of a general engineering job yeah. that wasn't working robotics. And obviously I did a, a lot of robotics coursework at CMU. Yeah. Uh, I did a minor in robotics in undergrad too. So I got a lot of exposure there and then nice. my master's was robotics. So that's really what I wanted. Where'd you do, do. your undergrad? Uh, electrical and computer engineering. Where, where'd you go? CMU as well. Oh, okay, cool. I yeah. didn't realize. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. And then... So for the MRC program, did the year of coursework, had to do a seven month internship. I did that internship with Naya, and as an intern at Naya, I brought up our first ever s and platform. s and Science and technology. Got like it. Like R&D platform. Yeah. Uh, as an autonomous vehicle. So I took a John Deere Gator side by side. Nice. Uh, we had a company contracted out to install actuators and things like that and put a raspberry pi for low level control and do some wiring for relays and things like that uh, but i took that you were reliant on a raspberry pi to control that thing for the low level control well i know but if that broke you would have lost actuation yep okay that's interesting 100 percent. well there was yeah. uh some motor controllers in the loop too that it yeah. spoke to we and we made a daughter board that's cool um but that was making the vehicle drive by wire nice and then we had computers in the back. Yeah. Uh, Microchain IMU, KVH Gyro, a couple of SBCs. Uh, and I Single got board to. computers. Yeah. I got to program all the low level control uh, for the actuation. Badass. All the mid level control for velocity and steering. Yeah. Uh, the entire perception stack yeah. using stereo cameras, the entire so localization stack. Fusing yeah. inertial sensors, and then I integrated with the planning capability that Naya had at the time. That's awesome. It was so much fun. So, for people listening that aren't roboticists, I'd like to define some of those terms just yeah. to, to make it like. Okay, so low level controls are like turning a switch off and on, or like, you know, um, I don't know, is there something I'm missing? Like motors? 
I think valves. of it. Yeah. So basically, in those days, none of the vehicles were electrified yet. Yeah. Uh, and so you had very analog systems, and to m allow it to be controlled by software, you needed to electrify it with these aftermarket kits or yeah. uh, modifications. And so you'd get a motor controller and get a linear actuator and bracket it in and bolt it down inside so the vehicle to like literally push the gas. That's why. So the gas, if you lost power, would just be pushed down. So you probably need a kill switch. Yes for the uh, actual fuel to the engine. Yeah, yep. yeah, That's... and it was wired in such a way that you hit the e-stop and in hardware. Uh, it would kill the, probably the power It would kill the, the actuators and those actuators were such that they would disengage. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So you didn't even kill the engine, you just would kill, well, you probably did kill the engine, I would think. Uh, I don't remember actually. Oh, that's interesting. I don't remember. But you still had, it sounds like a momentary linear actuator in this case, so you had the ability to yeah, and so low-level control is me speaking to a motor controller from the Raspberry Pi um, over a DAC to say... Digital analog converter. To say, <laughs> I want you to go to this percent effort in your stroke. Yeah. Right, and so you have... How far out it is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have some it's voltage translated. that corresponds to the, yeah. the full stroke of your actuator. And so if I want 50% gas, you know, that maps to this yep. voltage. Yeah. That's awesome. And you have that on your throttle, you have it on your gas, you have it on your transmission, you have an actuator on your steering wheel. Uh, and yeah, you, you make all of those move uh, nice. through generally voltage commands. And nowadays you've got electrified vehicles with CAN buses and all this stuff is controlled via CAN. Yeah, So that's awesome. I mean, it's just neat that you got to do that kind of from the ground up on that gator. Yep, and yep. I will say the transmission in particular was a giant nightmare. And we actually still have this vehicle to this was it day. A, was it a manual transmission? Yeah. And so oh, it, it had an actuator added to it. To Wait, just one? Yes. Did, wouldn't you have to actuate the clutch and the, the shift lever? There was no clutch actuation as far as I remember. Okay. It was right on that um, hand shifter. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Not ideal. Yeah. Because it would get stuck. You'd uh, have the actuation system when i set it in software try to move it it would get stuck on the transmission and you'd hear a as the transmission spun and you would try to uh if you were a person oh in the it would vehicle, be between gears yeah just making that noise yep. yeah if you were a person in the vehicle you'd literally be there shaking it and like moving it back and forth and i would grab onto the rail and like go like this and oh geez. so there was software in there to if it got stuck and wasn't moving jiggle it go back go forth go back go forth yeah. feather the gas Oh, that's interesting. All the things that you don't really care about. So you had like subroutines for that that would, mm -hmm. yeah, that would deal with that. That's that's interesting. Yeah, not not worth the time. Yeah. And so nowadays we've got test vehicles that are electrified and it's just can controlled and it just goes straight to the gear that you want. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, but I mean, you still it's still a fun exercise, I think, to get yeah, all that absolutely. stuff going. Absolutely, and I will. Say, somebody had to make that electrified vehicle work, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I will say. Uh, the low level control is fun, but the most fun part is perception. And perception is so where. Perception is seeing where things are for people listening yeah. and seeing, trying to figure out what things are when looking at them. Yep. Yep. And for the off road robotics that we yeah. work on, the fundamental piece is what I always call traversability estimation. You're trying to use cameras. Can I go over it or exactly. do I have to go around it? Yep. Okay. Yep, and in an off well, traversability would just be can I go over it? That's that's probably it. Like mm -hmm. if it's traversable, I can go over it. If it's not traversable, I can't go over it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in the off environment, we don't have roads, street signs, traffic lights, yeah. and that infrastructure, or even the assumption that there should be a drivable road. Right? You might have an off road vehicle that's looking at a scene where nothing is drivable, uh, and it has to think about the rocks, the bushes, the trees concertina wire, chain link fences, water, cliffs. Yeah. Uh, so the the perception, even on the on-road space, is really where the heart of robotics is. concertina is. wire typically drivable? Or, sorry, uh, what, the, what's the word you used? Concertina wire, yeah. Like no, 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 the wire. word you used for whether or not you can drive over it. Traversable. Traversable, yeah. yeah. Can you traverse over it? Depends on the wire? vehicle. All right, fair. Yeah, so I've worked on everything from, and I give this spiel all the time, and 
talks and conferences and things like that. Small EOD robots you can pick up with your hands to your typical side-by-side -side ATV all the way up to the multi-ton construction and mining vehicles. Yeah. So, you know, if you've got a mining vehicle... When you say multi-ton lightly, you mean multi-story, like... Well, literally multi-ton, yeah. Well, I mean, like, a car is multi-ton. That's true. I don't know if I ever thought that far ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I, I heard it described to me uh, at one point. But, yeah. yeah, that's true. I mean... The small construction vehicles are like 12,000 pounds. Yeah. But you're talking about like a 400 ton haul truck, presumably. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mining or construction vehicle where the tire is bigger than a house. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is wild. Um, the ones we used to work at at Droid Global, we had these four story um, the shovels mainly is what I worked on shovels and I worked on a blast hole driller. Mm hmm. And the blast hole driller was, it would drill holes, um, mainly GPS guided surface navigation is what I wrote on that. And um, it would drill holes in a uh, surface mine and then fill them with Semtec explosives, then you blow the whole sheet. Yeah. And then the shovels were interesting because those were like four stories high and there's a staircase across the radiator which gives you an idea of scale. Yep. And those ones, like you said, the tires. Uh, we, we worked on, I think those, I think um, you're thinking of maybe drag lines or are you thinking of the ones where like it's mm -hmm. articulated on like a, a track platform i believe the latter okay is what i'm thinking of so i, I don't know if we ever referred to them as rope shovels in, in the advanced automation group i worked there very shortly it was my first job out sure. of grad school. i could have the acronym or the name wrong yeah, yeah. but um they definitely did have cables between the linkages so that mm -hmm. might be i could see them being called that from, yeah. from what they were sure and um and they were neat like um I had one coworker where it was just the coolest thing that he was able to sort of figure out the kinematics of it. Mm -hmm. Although yeah. later having worked with him, I suspect he might not have actually gotten it working. Um, there, there was there were some interesting things uh, going on there that were that were pretty neat. So, yeah, that's that's a sweet yeah. sweet field. Yeah, the the most fun I had on that vehicle, and really on every robotics problem, is the perception piece because the perception yeah. piece is the one that really holds these systems back from being fielded. And yeah, again, that's sure. the same on-road as it is off-road. So that's where, in my opinion, the most fun research is happening. And the so, way I describe this is generally the same way you've got vehicles, cars, that you can't fully take advantage of because of failures in autonomy. Within the autonomy stack, you've got pieces of localization and control and planning and mission planning that you can't fully take advantage of because of failures in perception. So perception is really the long pole. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, when you say the long pole, I, I'm not, not that's super familiar a, with that term. That's a phrase I've heard uh, people say over the years, uh, which essentially just means, what's the thing holding the tent up? Like the thing that's really- The long pole. Yes, okay, the cool. long pole. Yeah, that's really the crux of the problem. It's going to take the longest to like set up. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's definitely the most advanced thing you're describing, I guess, out of all these things. Yep. I mean, there's absolutely really fun problems in uh, planning, especially when you're moving at speed. You're thinking about kinodynamics. You're trying to do multi-point turns in an off-road environment with, you know, you have to boulder your tires and uh, do a multi-point turn to fit through trees. Like a lot of that stuff. When you is say boulder your fun. tires, what does that refer to? Uh, like bouldering. Well, um, I, I get that. Like what that driving, means, like climbing sense, but I should say you have to think about your wheel placement as you boulder. Oh, that's interesting. So, it's using an active suspension to move your tires up and down to traverse over literal boulders. You could certainly use an active suspension, but what I'm talking about is you're viewing the environment through your sensors, cameras, okay. lidar, maybe radar. Um, you've got a world model. You need a plan. How am I going to do this? Let's say it's a three-point turn. Yeah. So the planning aspect is trying to say, as I'm executing these three pieces, these three legs of the turn, you have to think about the world model and your vehicle model and say, if I drive over here, where exactly will my wheels be? Am I going to beach myself? Am I going to induce a dangerous roll? Uh, if you're moving at speed through off-road environments, you have to think about wheel jolt because you could you know, destroy the vehicle, pop tire. That's interesting. So potholes, you know, would be a good yeah. example on in the on-road space. Yeah. 
that's that's really interesting that you're mm -hmm. able to get your head around those problems because it's just fun to work yeah. it's fun to work it's fun to be outside and uh with vehicles in nature doing some high-tech stuff it's a nice blend yeah so you were telling me a little bit at the event about um trying to figure out what a thing is that you're thinking about driving through. So like telling mm -hmm. the difference between like water and vegetation and yep. water and mud and just flat ground uh, dirt, right? Uh, can you talk at all about like how that's done uh, or is that getting into territory that we can't go into? Yeah, I think we can talk about it uh, okay. at a high level at least for sure. Uh, I mean, it really comes down to semantic classification. You're trying to say, what is the object type? of something in the scene and to your point you're talking about rocks you're talking about terrain classification uh, one of the biggest drivers or i should say one of the biggest needs for semantic classification off-road is for vegetation and so the first thing you, that you can do when you're looking at a point cloud that you're going to get from a lidar or from a stereo camera the first thing that you can do and that is readily apparent in that point cloud data is geometric structure of the scene we can talk about resolution and aggregation of point clouds over time, which is certainly a feeder into how well you can uh, estimate that geometric structure. But if you look at the scene through geometric structure alone, a bush has a large height differential just like a rock does. Yep. And so if you're just looking at something like height differentials to say what is or is not traversable, you get to scenarios where you have, you know, you could have an Abrams tank in a field of grass that's scared to move because the graph looks tall or the grass looks tall. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so you have to start bringing in multimodal sensor fusion, which is to say you have to look at RGBD, bringing in color data, texture and all that stuff on top of just the geometric structure. So in theory, though, if you spray painted a rock green, like, mm -hmm. I mean, would, would that look somewhat like grass yeah feel, and yeah. I, maybe it looks like a mossy rock and okay interesting that, that speaks i think to the difficulty of the problem and so the breadth to which you are trying to operate these vehicles exponentially increases how difficult it is yeah right and so off-road autonomy there's plenty of pieces that are unsolved and i often refer to the uh, five fundamental failures of off-road autonomy and those are going to be negative obstacles, holes so like in the ground, holes. cliffs, ravines, yeah. the vegetation, thin obstacles, What's which an example of that concertina wire, the yeah. chain link fences, things that are very difficult to see at range simply because they're so small. But and a telephone pole count, or is that? I would say the the wire that comes okay. from a telephone pole certainly, yeah. not the pole itself. That's usually it. big enough that you can get a really good read on it. Uh, but the the wire that comes down is yeah. definitely an example. Um, and you know the way the lidar beam uh, spreads out as you get farther away, right? Yeah. At range, that distance, that gap between lidar rings is going to be huge, and it's easy to miss. Plenty of things obstacles. pass through the middle of that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so let's see. I did negatives, vegetation, thin obstacles, um, water. Interesting. It's another one. There's a couple different ways that uh, water will manifest itself in uh, lidar and stereo. Uh, and well, I can then, also imagine, depending on the depth of the water, it being a very difficult thing to have to worry about, like a lake versus a puddle. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll mention the last one, and then I'll talk a little bit about okay. it. So Sounds the good. last one is inclement weather. What's so inclement? Just rain, bad weather. Bad weather. Okay. Rain, snow, dust even that you kick up. Uh, yeah. So you've got basically these particulates in the air and that, that are giving you false readings. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But on the water side, uh, a lot of it is driven by depth which you mentioned, and then particulate density of the water. So if you got really muddy water and you're looking at it with something like a LiDAR, uh, you might get a return right off the top. And so you will see from a geometric structure perspective that flat surface looking like ground. Yeah. In which case your robot might think, oh, great, okay, this is nice and smooth. I should try to drive on that because one of the things that we do when we generate off-road autonomy stacks is try to drive on the easiest terrain, right? Nice, yeah. Uh, if it's got no particulate, it's crystal clear, your LiDAR beam might go straight through. If it's shallow, it might bounce off the bottom. And so maybe you think the ground surface is where the ground actually is and not at the height uh, of the water, but you still need to be able to detect 
what that water depth is, depending on the size of your vehicle. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And then, like you said, if it's very deep, if you're looking at the ocean, you might not get any return. And then you think there's nothing there. Oh, and it looks like a negative obstacle. Yeah, like, a, like and, you're looking off a cliff. Yeah, yeah. And so then hopefully you're thinking about negative obstacles and voids in the data, which are also very difficult because, again, you're, you're trying to detect that as which what's, that which what's is What's the problem there. with looking at the ocean as a negative obstacle, though? Because I would think functionally you'd approach the ocean in a big-ass cliff like very yeah. similarly. It depends on how you treat unknown. Okay. Because you're going to have unknown areas in your cost map simply with respect to... Uh, cost map meaning view. like the cost of traversal over various... Yeah, so yeah. yeah. From a planning perspective, we generally discretize the world into a grid. Okay. And you can do a 2D grid, you can do a 2.5D grid where you've got a stixel representation where each cell has a height, or you could go full 3D with the voxels. Okay. So let's take the case where you're using just a 2D grid. Stixel's a good word for that. Yeah, I've never I like heard that. that. Stixel from know, Pixel, yeah. yeah. And it sticks up out of a thing on the ground. So. Yeah, yeah. So take the case where you've got the 2D grid. Each cell will have a cost to traverse. And you'll have some threshold where the cost is lethal. Yeah. And so for the boulder, if you're doing the very first thing, which is a height differential, you see, you know, the rock is, you look at points in the cell for the rock, and maybe the rock is a couple of cells, and then the ground around it is a couple of cells, and you're looking at height differentials between cells. And so you'd see the rock has a differential above half a meter, and maybe half a meter is what your vehicle's tires can drive over. Yeah. And so that's where you set your lethal threshold, and you say, okay, that is something I can't drive on. I will avoid it. And then maybe if you only have a, a 10 centimeter bump, that incurs a little cost and you'd rather drive on something flat. Yep. But, but if you had to, you could, if you you had could to, traverse you over right. the top of and that. And so, because of your sensor field of view, it's not infinite, you can't see everything. Yep. You're not getting a LiDAR return from everything. Uh, you could have random pockets of cells with unknown cost. Yep. You don't have any data there. Just because you can't see it. It's yep. a blind spot. Yeah. If you think about how we see, like I can't see behind you right now. Yep. So we call that a range shadow, where those cells might technically be within a ray traced field of view, but there's occlusion. Why, why range shadow? Uh, range shadow, well, the sensor is generally giving you a range reading. Range shadow. Yes. I heard rain like it's raining. Oh, okay. no, no, range, range shadow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. More sense. yeah. And so like, right, yeah, as you go out yeah. to get that range reading and you move outward from the sensor. Yeah, uh, it's occluded. And incur range, yeah, yeah. it's occluded. Um, so there's gonna be a huge unknown space behind you. Yep. Uh, and then if and there is simply a hill. Or if you've got a sensor mounted high and the chassis blocks the yep. reading of something Absolutely. low on the ground. Yep, yeah. you create blind spots for sure. Yeah. Uh, and then if you've just got a hill, that hill might come down the other side of the slope that's traversable, but you can't see it. Yeah. So that, if if this was a hill right here, I can't see the ground for like two meters on the other side of this table. Yeah, that makes sense. And so you're creating pockets of unknown throughout the environment for things that are not always negative obstacles. Interesting. And so you're trying to differentiate between those and the true negatives. Yeah. That's the hard part. I, that's really interesting, because I kind of wonder, you know, do you just approach slowly? So, like, when you get there, you don't... Yeah, you can absolutely do that. Because, I mean, what if it is a negative obstacle? Then you're, you're losing the asset, right? I mean, yep. you, could, you could do and a lot of damage. And often time is of the essence, you know, for many reasons. Ah, so slow also is, is bad for that reason. Yeah, I mean, on the military side, obviously, you might be getting shot at. Yeah. On the commercial side, time is money. Yeah. You know, take the mining example or even construction. Yeah. If you slow down and take forever to accomplish these jobs you might not hit profitability. Yeah. So everybody wants these things to go faster. But like, wouldn't it not be so bad to slow down the first time you encounter a thing in construction or mining where you're going through the same area over and over, then you remember it for next time yep. and you're like, okay, I can blitz through here because it's totally yep, safe. But... Absolutely. And at that point you've gone through, you've already built your world model. Yeah. Uh, and that's absolutely the case. And a lot of the times you can slow down, try to get closer, build up your confidence in the world model, and we do uh, some work where we explicitly think about what pose do I need to achieve to maximize my confidence in the world model. 
So if I'm trying to traverse through an area and this is the only area I can find, but I'm not sure I can drive over it, where can I go to try and understand the world, understand the scene best? So we'll drive over, try to get a better view, build up the confidence to say, okay, yes, we can go here or no, we have to take the expensive option and you know, backtrack and go all the way around. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And then if you get close to a op uh, negative obstacle, like I could look over this table and look down. Yeah. And at that point, I have the full geometric structure. And at yeah. that point, if you can guarantee you've captured the shape, the geometric structure of every object in the scene, then you can do a lot. Yeah, and that makes sense. that's certainly a way to detect visible negatives, but a lot of negatives are not visible, right? It's yeah. like this table where I look and there's something on the other side. Yeah. I don't know if it drops off or maybe there's three steps there. I just don't know until I yeah. can actually get a view. Yeah, that's interesting. And if you're getting shot at, I mean, like, and you're never going to go through that area again because you're, yep. you know, getting the And you've never there. been there before. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah. The military side of the equation definitely has that a lot of. It seems like a different set of difficult. decision matrix or uh, matrix metrics. Yeah. Yeah. Decision points. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. Metrics might not be the right way. Yeah. In general, the, the place these things are going to be fielded first is going to be where you can constrain the environment. Yeah. And you see that on mining too. And mining has been the by far the most successful fielding of off road autonomy yeah. because you it is heavily constrained. Yeah. And it, it fits a lot with the the three Ds. And I would say maybe even the four Ds. What you're so, talking about dull, dirty, and dangerous. Yep. Dull, dirty, dangerous, and I'll add a fourth one of dollars. Dollars, like, yeah, I like that. <laughs> there's a lot of money in mining. Yeah. And these vehicles, like we said, are bigger than houses. So yeah. uh you know, mining substantially uh, bigger in some cases. Yeah, yeah, and mm -hmm. I think Caterpillar started feeling the first uh, quote-unquote autonomous mining vehicles in 1994. I don't know if it was uh, just teleoperation. They were or definitely like the that. industry leaders in that. So, yeah. like, they were, as far as I know, they were the ones that everyone else tried to mimic. You mm -hmm. know, and so yeah, like, and then I think Komatsu leapfrogged them. I forget the exact time, but it's sometime in the 2000s. Yeah, um, and then Joy was like not the fastest but still yeah. out there yeah yeah, yeah. and, and so Komatsu acquired joy yep so their yeah. autonomy is probably you know really good now <laughs> yeah and the the last article i read i think caterpillar was at like 550 autonomous mining trucks was different types yeah i don't know the exact yeah. numbers but that's the number that i i remember reading this week that's pretty cool i've not heard that stat yeah um but the point being those aren't like instances of those are different types of autonomous mining trucks I believe there are instances of. Okay, so there are 500 in the field. Yeah. Got it. That okay, was my thanks. understanding. This is just me reading an article this week that I happen to remember. Yeah, that's that's a very different number than like different yeah. types well, of vehicles. When yeah. these mining vehicles are millions of dollars each. Yeah, yeah. No, it's still impressive either way. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just, you know, conceptualizing it. They're, they're mm -hmm. different numbers. Yep, <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but mining, you can constrain the environment. Yep. You're asking people to go out to remote locations. Yep. If it is, if a child done shows a up, it's something is horribly wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so you, you're kind of in isolation, and you've got no. You can have your life. people wear, you know, RFID tags, so you know where they're at. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do in that environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you've got relatively maintained dirt roads. They're not roads, and they change, and there's dust and rocks and berms and different things like that. Um, What's a berm? Uh, if you have, like, a cliff, yeah, you'll pile dirt to create a wall. Oh, interesting. So it's, like, sort of like a slope. Um, so it prevents access to It's like a cliff? ridge line. Okay. It's like a ridge line. It might be something intentionally built on the side of, a, like, a cliff face right there yeah. for a road, or it could be something that maybe you're just digging uh, material out of and you kind of create it naturally so it's a consequence of, okay yeah that makes sense mm -hmm. um, like a hilly wall yeah, yeah yeah and it's dangerous because these are giant giant machines that could easily run a person over oh for with sure a single tire yeah um, and the especially if you're going underground right there's yeah. a lot of um, dust that's produced in the mining process that you don't want to be breathing in so yeah it's just a perfect application for well, and all that dust gets in your sensors too and makes the apertures or yep. not the aperture the you got to clean the sensors yeah they're dirty as heck um we had some interesting ways of, of keeping dust off the sensors uh in my mining work mm -hmm. 
that I think I can get into because of patents, but I probably shouldn't just in case I'm wrong, so I won't. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but it's yeah. a great great application for off road autonomy, uh, and definitely the most successful to date. Construction is a really hard one because of the variety you can find in the scene. And so it's kind of the opposite. When you say the variety in the scene, what do you yeah. what do you mean in layman's terms? You could have people, you could have a bobcat, you could have a 308, you could have somebody digging a ditch with a shovel. You What's could a have 308? a 308? Uh, excavator. Got it, okay. Uh, you could have somebody uh, digging a hole with a shovel, you could have an I-beam being carried across. Yeah. You, somebody could spill a bucket. Uh, there's just, you have no idea what could be there. Yeah. Right? It's a very unconstrained environment. Have you looked and at it's changing at a rapid pace? Oh, for sure. So, have you looked at um, like oil and gas at all? Like, like fracking sites, for instance. Like those are are cluttered as heck. I have not, but I, I'm not aware of all work that's been done. There's in AM, there's some work we looked we into, have. and and they're just there's like all sorts of just you know weird obstacles and um, like wires being strung across and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, if if you look at like oil refineries, like this isn't like my primary expertise, but you know, just looking at it from somebody trying to figure out how to get a robot through it, like there's there's a lot of uh, thin obstacles, as you put it, like right. a lot of a lot of thin obstacles, and people just all over the place, and it's it's challenging environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's not the right first place to field fully autonomous systems. Yeah, and you you see the same thing with the on road industry, right? Like the people who went for the level five have mostly failed. No one's been successful with level five. What has been successful is incremental fielding of new features, and the best example there that I always give uh, is going from lane departure warning to lane departure assist to lane keeping, right? Yeah. Like. You're keeping it super simple, super incremental in a way where Active you Active cruise control. Yeah, exactly. That's another great example, yeah. for sure. Um, even cruise control itself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you're doing it in a way that's really small changes. So An automatic can... transmission. Yes. Mm. Yeah. You're doing it in a way that you can provide value to your customer and actually make a profit as opposed to you know going for the long shot getting tons of VC money and trying to hit a home run. Uh, and I think offer autonomy developers like Naya and others need to take that lesson to heart and look for the, the just the good business models. The short putts. Yeah, like yeah. look for the MVPs, the minimum viable products. I'm kind of a big fan of that, right? Like I, I'm a huge fan of just doing something practical now as opposed yeah. to doing something ambitious never. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to push at NAIA as well. Yeah. Like we do so much cool, advanced, uh, applied research for off-road autonomy. We have programs looking at negative obstacle detection. We've run that successfully on vehicles. We have programs looking at vegetation filtering. Um, we've got programs that are doing uh, fully autonomous demolition. Oh, that's uh, pretty cool. Using a 299 and a jackhammer. What's we've, a 299? Um, skid steer. Oh, that's pretty cool. is a skid steer. How, what's the scale on one of those? I think that's about 12,000 pounds, I want to say. Not bad. Uh, you can fit one person in the cab. So it's like a like a bobcat, kind of. Bobcat would be a small one. Okay. It's like roughly two bobcats. Okay, that's pretty cool. That sounds like fun, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've got programs where there are amphibious vehicles that are navigating the surf zone. We were talking about water detection earlier. Yeah. You, you know, LiDAR there has that same problem where on calm water in the surf zone. What's the surf zone? The area where waves are made. Okay, got it. So you're trying to go from uh, shore to sea and back yeah. through the surf zone. So through all the waves. So you've got to approach it head on so you don't capsize probably. Yep, yep. Yeah. And so you've got, if you're using a LiDAR in that scenario, we have all these problems we talked about with uh, their signature response in the water. Yeah. But just an interesting data point, the white caps will give you a return. Oh, that's interesting. And so you could start to do, th- uh, start to use that feature of LiDAR to track white caps in the Oh, waves. that's really interesting. So there's like all these cool problems that we do on all these different types of programs. So it's, yeah, it's super fun. Yeah, that's, uh, that's super cool. Oh, I forget why I started mentioning that. 
Uh, I think we were talking about MVPs, like like a short putt where yes, you can get like yes, a, a thing yes, that works a little you. bit. So we do all that Not cool thing, research. A, a thing that works a lot, but a minimal thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So the point I was trying to make was that we do all this cool research on all these awesome pro, uh, programs that are pushing the state of the art forward. But the th as much as I love those applications, and I absolutely do, I love doing that research. I really want to see our technology because we've developed so many cool things. If you take nuggets out of it, you can package it into those MVPs and you yeah. can field pieces of them that are product level reliable. Yeah. And so what I think off-road autonomy should be doing is a lot of people have fielded teleoperable robots. Yeah. The next thing would be guarded teleop. Yeah, well, this then, is what we were talking about earlier with yeah. having an autonomy system that interdicts if you're trying to hit something in a yep. teleoperated sense that yep. you shouldn't be hitting. Yeah, and then you can do things like person follower or leader follower. Yeah. You can do route follow, which is, you know, this is the path. Somebody's told me this is a drivable path. I'm going to stick to the path and that's it. Yeah. And then you can have the research ongoing that Naya does a lot of for the true go to point. Yeah. Where you're starting at an... Uh, I say any A to any B. Yeah. You can start at any A and then do all the work in a novel environment for perception planning, localization control to figure it all out to get through some novel scene to get to B. And yeah. we're pushing that forward in a whole bunch of cool ways. But I think there's a lot of ways we can take pieces of that stack and create lower levels of capability that are actually fieldable in the right constrained environments as an MVP. So that's something yeah. that I'm very passionate about because I want to see people start to use this stuff. And I think it's just good business. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thing to hear from an autonomy expert too because you people, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I feel like a lot of times when you talk to people about autonomy, it's kind of what you said. It's it's like ambition and it's like, mm -hmm. well, we're just going to make it drive everywhere. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah. no. Like, well, yes, eventually. But like for now, let's maybe yeah. – do something and, like more robust on a smaller scale and make right. money on that and then you know you can build on that so yeah there is such a huge difference between a demonstration and a product amen to that brother and so we can do a whole bunch of cool stuff right i can put a vehicle in a field with a cliff click a point on the other side and show that hey we're detecting this cliff we're seeing the vegetation we're driving through the vegetation not driving over the cliff but there are edge cases where that will fail and for something to reach product level maturity, you need that 99.999%. And maybe we're at 80%. Maybe we're even at 90%. Yeah. Maybe we're at 95%. That's still not enough. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so if you're trying to grow a business, you need to find the pieces that can make that MVP that are 99.99% reliable. Yeah. Right? Because that 10% where it doesn't work is going to be the ones everybody puts on Google and YouTube and sues yeah. over and, you know, yeah. knocks the company out I mean, of you can literally yeah. kill people, yeah. right? We saw that happen with on-road vehicles. Yeah, for so, sure. Luckily, I think it was only a couple cases, but still, I mean, a couple cases is still a couple people dying. So, yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't think any of us wants to kill people. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. That's the, that I think is really important for the off-road industry to identify. And I think mining's done a great job with that. I think construction absolutely needs to find the MVPs. Because and I think they're working so on dynamic. Like I've been, yeah. I've been impressed with some of the stuff I've been seeing from Built Robotics lately in terms mm. of their demos, at least. Again, it's hard to know how much of that's a product and yeah. how much is a demo. I, I don't know a lot for certain in that realm. Yeah. Um, I think I will simply say the same statement I made, which is there's a huge difference between a demonstration of a capability and a product. Yeah, it's fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, like, yeah, as somebody that specializes in early stage new product development, I mean, you know, we've, we've made a lot of demos. Like yeah. That's, yeah. And it's, and it's mean, still not easy. I mean, people are like, hey, well, anyone can make it. No. Like, I'd yes, like to see correct. you do it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> But at the same time, I mean, to, to create that long tail is a different selection process for what you want to put that on and also a different like set of skills to robustify. And, you know, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's, uh, 
it's definitely worth doing if you want to earn money on selling the same thing over and over and over again to a wide market. Yeah, and there's just, just so many pieces to a robot. Yeah. You've got the whole mechatronic platform, which it in and of itself is an engineering marvel. Sure. And I then agree. you're trying to add... It's my favorite part to work on. Yeah, and... Well, yeah. I like you using that part yeah. to work on the software side. The yeah. software side is my favorite part. Yeah, yeah I get that. Uh, That's why I'm enjoying this conversation. But even the, like even the lidar, out. even the camera, like yeah. every part of the oh, system for sure. is a huge product. In a and hard drive is an yeah. incredible it's, mechatronic it's device, insane. even though no one uses them anymore. But like, yeah, you're yeah. trying to take like multiple computers and make them smart enough to move around the world. Yeah, and then actuate that whole thing and. It's, it's pretty crazy uh, how many things you have to get right. Yeah. So I think, especially in robotics, where the system is already so complicated, it emphasizes more strongly the fact that you need to find the constrained application with an MVP if you really want to build a product that's autonomous. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. This is kind of a weird out there question. And uh, tell me if you don't want to talk about this, but what are your thoughts on consumer robots? Yeah. Um, like totally different than what either of us works on. I just right, thought it might be fun right. to talk about. So, I mean, iRobot Roomba, right, is, yeah. is clearly the most successful example. Well, and that's a great example of an MVP. I mean, they took yeah. a bumbling algorithm that just yep. kind of goes in circles and dead rackets. Yeah, and now they're doing slam with a beacon base but how much value system. did that really add i wonder right like i mean it's it's cool well like as a roboticist i like it but like yep. as somebody that just wants my house vacuumed like do you really need like i would say is it, a slam vacuuming job that much better than a bumbling blind person bumping into all I your crap so because there's probably it's a lot of following a grid it's not hitting the same place there yeah there's probably a lot of like, blind spots in yeah. the um naive approach where yeah. you're just bouncing and returning at the same angle, uh, which I believe is what it originally did. And you have your cliff sensors that are making sure you don't drive yeah. upstairs. So I, I would say the slam stuff is necessary uh, at this stage in the uh, vacuum cleaning robot industry yeah. for iRobot to continue to establish itself as the gold standard. So it's more of a differentiation than a necessity. Is nobody else doing slam besides iRobot, though? I, I don't know. I'm sure somebody is. Yeah. Uh, but I would think they were the first. Yeah, most uh, likely. And I, I think they there was an acquisition. Yeah. <laughs> I believe uh, iRobot acquired a company to get their slam beacon base. Uh, That's interesting. Localization. I wonder if it was... I know Nito was like early on in slam. I, I wonder mm. if... It had something to do with that, but yeah, maybe I'm yeah. I'm just speculating here. I, yeah, but I, I think that's a good example where you had an MVP that was dirt simple, and it provided value, and so it, it led to a, a large company. And now they have the opportunity, after they've established a product and are bringing in lots of revenue and are profitable, to go after the advanced pieces and really productize that. Yeah. So, uh, my hope. Well, and like the stakes of getting that wrong are a lot lower than the stakes of getting an off-road vehicle wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, if you crash a Roomba, you're smearing dog crap around your living room. You know, yep. if you crash, you know, a tank or a car, people are going to yeah. die. Yep. yep. You're going to lose a multi-million dollar asset. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. But uh, my hope is that what Naya is right now, which is, you know, a company that does really cool applied research to push the boundaries of the state of the art and offer an autonomy becomes the uh, advanced research division of a larger company that's developing products of off-road vehicles. Uh, and so we're doing, all, we've always done a lot of cool stuff in the applied research side. And I'm trying to bring up some of the, uh, the lower tier capability that yeah. can be an MVP that can be product level reliable. Yeah. I'm I'm really curious what those things are, but I'm guessing that's into getting into you can't talk about it territory. I kind of talked about it a little bit, okay. right? In terms of like, take the incremental steps, right? What do vehicles do now? Teleoperation. Well, I get that in theory, but I'm curious what some of the incremental steps for off-road autonomy would look like. Like, what would be? I get guarded I tele -op. Yeah, guarded guarded, guarded tele -op. Tele -op, leader follower. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I don't think they're. I don't think it's. Uh, Human following. Yeah, I don't think it's like boom a, a huge no, none of that's, innovative idea. Yeah, it's yeah. just it's kind of uh, intuitive. I think. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of what I always like. We had a vehicle we worked on for a little bit where we were just trying to do human following to start, you know, mm -hmm. and then just stay on the path, like you said, you know. Yeah. 
I mean, the, the more basic, the better, I think. Like, yes. The less to go wrong. Yep. The shorter the putt, the lower your cost of R&D. I mean, there's so many different reasons, but, mm -hmm. you know, people probably want it, you know, 70% as much. You know, I mean, there's lots of... Yeah. 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 The commercial side definitely wants a lot of costs uh, driven down. Yeah. So uh, on the research programs, uh, you've got way more flexibility with that because they're one-offs. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. But... You asked about the consumer side. Well, I was also going to ask if you'd seen the uh, Amazon Astro yet. I don't believe so. It's, it's incredibly cute. It's, is that it's, a dog? Like the Jetson dog? Uh, I didn't know there was a Jetson Was dog. it the Jetsons that their dog was named Astro? I think I you're think? right. They, they yeah. probably did name it after that. Yeah. It's a um, it's a little consumer robot. It's uh, It's got a tablet for a face, uh, like, like the Rethink Robotics Baxter used to have. Mm -hmm. It's got um, a little pivot that the tablet goes on, so it can kind of look up at you from the ground. It is dog height. It's, okay. it's very short. It's got like maybe 11 inch diameter wheels, if I had to put a guess to it. Uh, like mm -hmm. they're big wheels, so it can like drive over your foot pretty easily. Yeah. Um, and then it's got like a pretty interesting sensor suite. Amazon's selling them for 1800 bucks. Oh, wow. Which you got to wonder who's buying these yeah. things because there's no practical That's application. That's definitely obvious, right? It, it can carry like a beer because there's a cup holder that ships on it so you can i guess maybe enthusiasts more than yeah obvious. i think that's it you can tell it yeah. to find a person so like i have two friends that have this and they're like a husband and wife and they'll be like hey astro find you know the other person and then it'll go around <laughs> and like it'll like look okay and then when it catches a glimpse of, glim glimpse of their face it does like i think the anchor point yeah sensing where it's like oh that's so and so i found yeah. them and then you know you got your beer out of the back yeah. So it's it's kind of dumb, but it's also kind of adorable and cute. And then like its main behavior is it'll just go to different rooms and kind of dwell there for a bit and hang out. Yeah, I feel like that's got to be. I don't more know how many units they're gonna sell. Stunts. Yeah. Yeah. Are they? I don't feel like that's really gonna sell a lot. Yeah. Um, like the people that have this, I know, are like roboticists, and so I think yeah. it's like yeah. for them, it's cool, and they have disposable income. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Eighteen hundred is pretty expensive, so I think. I don't know if enthusiast is the right label, but it kind of early makes adopters. Sense. I yeah. think you yeah, know, yeah, like yeah. people that are interested in robots, right? And I think you have to be on a list to get it because I'm pretty sure even at 1800, they're probably. If I had to guess, they're probably making it a loss because if you look at like the sensing suite, like it's it's pretty complex. Like there's yeah. there's a lot of sensors on it. Like it has a periscope that comes up that can like wow get up to yeah I'll like, have to look this like up. human yeah it's probably... uh, chest height. And so it, and it's got four cameras on the, it's got at least two cameras. It might only have two. Mm -hmm. It's got either two or four cameras on the periscope that telescopes out at the top of it. And then it's got like an illumination LED on that periscope as well. Like yeah. there's a lot of tech in it. Like it's, it's a lot of cell phones put together basically. It seems like it's got to be yeah. like a publicity stunt or some sort of market. Or they're trying to collect data on people's houses yeah. for some future product. <laughs> yeah. Because they're, what they're doing slam on your house. Like with that, like yeah. that's. Yeah, yeah. That's how it but gets around. I will say the warehouse robotics, the AMR, uh, I think is a great application of that autonomy. stuff's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that like it, it's a heavily constrained environment. They've got QR codes or whatever else to map the internals, and there's tons of money right yeah. into making a warehouse more efficient, especially yeah. an Amazon warehouse. So that's yeah. that's a no brainer. That's like absolutely there needs to be autonomy there, and a lot of people are using that today and actively trying to improve that so yeah and there's a bunch of different ways to do it too it is interesting seeing some of the footage coming back from uh what's the trade show going on when we recorded this at time recording because this will come out like in like a couple months oh i don't know there's, there's a big trade show going on at the moment and i'm struggling on the name of it but there's interesting footage on linkedin that's like coming out of just uh you know just different demos from like uh, agility and boston dynamics mm -hmm. those are the ones everyone likes to look at so those are the ones that are like yeah. really Blast all over there. Yeah, the Boston that. Dynamics ones are, are interesting. Cause well, have you seen their new one? Where it's like, it's it's just a regular, uh, statically stable robot. But, no. yeah. They're, the ones that I've seen are obviously the I think the they call it Stretch. Atlas. I haven't seen Stretch, no. Yeah, Stretch is it's just a regular robot on a bin with like an arm. But I guess, you know, they're it's meant to be pretty good. So they, they had a demo they showed with it unloading a tractor trailer. was like the one sure. that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of those industries for a tractor trailer, uh, the industry being ag, or logistics, are suffering labor shortages. 
Yeah. But I mean, when I think of a tractor trailer, I think of like something that like a DHL or a FedEx or a UPS would use to move boxes around. Yeah. I, the problem is uh, any business cases I've seen to date that involve trying to replace like pick and place type stuff. Uh, if you have human laborers, the tech isn't advanced enough to be cheap enough to compete. Yeah, that's kind of the thing. So when, when you've got an industry like ag or construction that are facing labor shortages, then you've got a, a, a gap to fill that autonomy could potentially You need fill. it because you just can't get enough people. You just can't but then, get the workers. The thing with humanoid robots too, though, is... Or I don't know if we're talking specifically about humanoid or about just any... I would say... Tech that could it's replace a general a rule of thumb for when you're trying to replace people with robots. Yeah. At least with today's state of technology. To go humanoid. It depends on the case. Like if you, the more you can turn it into an automation project. Yeah, I feel like that's a better move. Like I don't know. Like not to be bearish on humanoid, but I. Yeah. I said this in Andrew Watson's podcast like recently, where I'm just like, I think I'm bearish on humanoid robots. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like it's you're. You've got like, you know, 30 to 50 actuators that could break. I mean, there's so many different, yep. you know, and also cost you money and also make your production more complicated. Super cool research problem. Yeah. I don't, I don't see a case where a humanoid. Robot like how much does an Atlas right. cost? Like 1 million, 2 million? I have no idea. And they're, I have no idea. they're not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's then funny like, though, because a lot of people see those Boston Dynamics dogs and Atlas and think that it's essentially the Terminator and that it exists. Well, that's what... That's what Aaron thought when I was on his podcast. He yeah. was like, I'm, is the future going to be utopian or dystopian? And I'm like, yeah. it's not that simple, first of all. And like, secondly, you know, like, it's that there's better ways to commit atrocities than with a robot. Like, that's the most yeah. inefficient. Yeah. Robots yeah. are not. It's a maintenance to take over nightmare. Anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. And that's. That's kind of interesting because you said earlier that it was interesting that my perspective was we should be looking at MVPs and lower level tech. But the reason I say that is probably because I see day in and day out the ways the advanced autonomy can fail. Yeah. Right. I yeah, know sure. all of the edge cases. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> there are some pretty funny uh, um, experimentations that have been done where uh, on the military side, they sat a robot somewhere. Uh, and they said, okay, soldiers, try to come up to this robot and disable it without it detecting you. You're talking about the Gladiator project or a different one? I don't remember which project okay. it was specifically, but uh, if you're familiar with Metal Gear Solid, the character Snake, who puts himself in a cardboard box to hide from people. I, I am not familiar with Metal Gear Solid, but that sounds hilarious. It, it's, tell like me, a, tell me more. it's like a spy game where you're yeah. trying to like move in and be stealthy, right? Yeah. And one of the funny things he does is put himself in a cardboard box. I know mostly does, from Does playing. he move and then duck down under the box yeah. and then move the box and then duck down? Uh, I, I haven't played the series enough to know yeah. if he moves the box. I know it It would be playing. hilarious if he moved the box. I yeah. feel like that's, that's the funniest gag. Yeah. I know it from playing Super Smash Brothers, uh, where Snake is a playable character. Yeah. And that's his like emote. Uh, is he puts himself in a cardboard box and then kicks it off but one of the soldiers in this experiment literally did that he took a cardboard box put it over his head and walked forward and the robot did not detect that there was a person there and he was able to get to the robot and turn it off (laughs) right like there's super easy ways uh and yeah you could work around that you could start doing like just general dynamic obstacle tracking and saying well i see this shape and I'm tracking it frame to frame and it's moving towards me and maybe I say, well, that's a problem. But all of those pieces take more and more time. Even with the box that's only moving when you're looking at it. Like I see, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think somebody else was like I held tracked. a bush in front of their face or that's something. That's hilarious. You know what I mean? Like it's not hard to beat these things right now. Yeah. Um, so I think there's yeah. uh, a long way to go before we worry about the Terminator, but I think it's absolutely something that we should be thinking about as a society. Uh, the Terminator? Sure, yeah, like the long term, <laughs> right? I think there is an ethical question. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we're going to see it in our lifetimes, but you yeah. know, it's still worth thinking about and making sure we don't... Really, for me, it's the maintenance piece, right? It's like if we ever get good at... Maybe, okay, so maybe, yeah, you're right. Outside of our lifetimes, we could roboticize the maintenance. But like, I mean, all these things break like pretty frequently. Like, yeah. I mean, I work around these machines on the low level hardware side enough that I've seen, you know, every single way a motor can break, like a shaft can torque, 
you know, I mean, it just, you know, yep. just a million different failure yep. modes. And I mean, that to me is, is what I look at as the, so it's interesting that you look at, you're like, yeah, the algorithms suck. Like you can fake it out with a bush. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's too complex mechanically. Like yeah. that, something's going to break and a person's going to have to fix it. And it's funny because a lot of the failure modes we can make progress on. Yeah. But there's just, again, to the, to the point that these robots are so complicated, they're like the most complex vehicles you can find in some cases off-road, combined with all this heavy computing and sensors and cameras and things that are products in, of them, in and of themselves, trying to combine it all together and make it work. Yeah. When you've got this system of systems like that, the failure there's mode so show up. many, yeah, there's so <laughs> many pieces. You know, it's so funny how you'll run autonomy demonstrations and you'll still have failure points, which are an ethernet cable malfunctioning. Yeah. And when you have, you know, like 75 of those types of things in one system, to your point, again, it just, the number of ways the system can break yeah. skyrocket. Well, so, and again, I mean, if you're, if you're in a Terminator scenario, like who's going to fix it? Like you get it, you can have a robot maintenance person fix your robot. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, like eventually maybe, but like we're, we're nowhere near yeah. that technology I mean, at this point. People are working on basic research for self-repairing robots, but it's like, I mean, it's like these worms that are like piezoelectric material and they can like bend. And, you know what I mean? It's like a slippery slope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's very trivialized examples. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, and, and they haven't gotten that right. You know, like yeah, that doesn't even yeah, work. Yeah. But it's, it is interesting. It's self-replicating because... is another interesting one, right? Where like people look yeah. at that as there's like that sci-fi thing with what is it like the like paperclip factory that decides to turn everyone and everything into a paperclip. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so yeah. like everyone's terrified of that. And I'm, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Like, these yeah. are. But it's interesting because I talk about how there's so many ways that you know the advanced stuff can fail. Uh, it's such a complex system, but there are a lot of ways where we know how we can improve or solve a problem. But when you're doing applied research all the time, uh, you're generally focused on the new capability that's the focus of that program. And you don't have the luxury of working on, you know, the 70 other things you see that you could do to improve the system. Yeah. Makes and sense. that's where you start getting into the product side and why I keep saying focus on the lower level tech, because the amount of effort to fix all these 70 other problems, even though we have known solutions and they're not necessarily hard individually, but the amount of human resources and time and dollars it'll take to actually get through all of them is a huge investment. Yeah. And so if, if you're a company that has hundreds of millions of dollars and VC backing, um, and Prague told you that, you know, Nea, he bootstrapped from the ground up, he took no VC funding. To Never ever? Sold. Yeah. No, yeah. I think I mean, he did say that, that, that is impressive. Yeah. Um, it's it's not a luxury that you have to start going after all of those 70 problems. Yeah, you're scoped in, especially if you're in a you're firm scoped flex in. contract yeah. for- And that know. that's really the art yeah. uh, of what I'm trying to do right now, which is on all of these individual programs where we're doing the coolest research I can think of for negative obstacles, vegetation, autonomous demolition, amphibious maneuvers, et cetera. How do we coordinate to try and push towards a core vision. And so finding the ways where, okay, you know, you're doing something really cool with SLAM and localization, and you're doing something really cool with planning where, you know, the multi-point turns are getting better and trying to uh, make sure that everybody's getting to benefit from the work that other people are doing is I wonder very if multi-point turn as a standalone feature would ever be valuable. <laughs> Parallel parking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Parallel. We, then, we have parallel park assist, don't we? But it kind of blows at them. Like, I mean, do, is it, do we have good parallel park assist? I now? don't know. We probably do by now. Nay, I think. I it. think the te the technology first came out in like the early two thousand tens. If there's an on road company provider that needs parallel parking, the stuff we've developed off road can definitely do it. So call me. H hire Nea for parallel parking. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But um, yeah. It's a, it's a hard problem. And that doesn't even get into all, the whole data rights question where, you know, you have to be, pay very close attention to all these contracts and the data rights for these things. And, you know, what can you reuse? 
And you, where you mean the intellectual you... property? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, if you know if uh, the DoD comes in on a Sibber, for yeah. example, Sibber is a good case where the government will get rights to it, but they're trying to support small businesses and they give you commercial rights. Yeah. But then there might be contracts that are unlimited data rights where the government gets you know rights to use it however they want uh, and they might control the distribution so that you can't use it commercially oh that's interesting so there it all depends on what the contract says yeah uh, but so when you're trying to coordinate you might not be able to reuse things yeah and so that makes it even harder uh, so that's very difficult uh, sometimes you have to just re-implement things from scratch for that data rights reason wow uh, and so, again, that just adds to the dollars and time and human resources that you need to stand some of these things Which up. Which reduces your scope. Yep. And when you get to the point, again, that robots have layers upon layers upon layers of pieces to it. I it, agreed. It just gets so hard. Yeah. Uh, and even when you have those billions of dollars that went into on-road driving, yeah. they were not successful. Yep. And that's they haven't because been yet. of... Yes. Eventually they will. Eventually but, they will. But yeah. in my opinion, it's going to be the incremental steps, right? That lane departure warning, the lane departure assist, the lane departure keeping, or the cruise control to adaptive cruise control to the like auto collision braking or avoidance. And then after like All another decade pieces, of that, eventually someone will release yeah. like, a true self-driving. The same way, yeah. the, same way uh, the robotic vacuum cleaners went from just your basic Pong game bouncing back and forth to now doing slam. Pong's a good descriptor. Yeah, to now doing slam, right? You get the bridge to the advanced capability is incremental steps of profitable yeah, MVPs. Yeah, and, and you pump that money back into the company and then you can afford to take those risks because right. you have profit products that are right. earning you cash. And you've just heavily mitigated risk, yeah. right? Each risk is a smaller chunk. Instead yeah. of taking all the risk at once, which yeah. the on-road industry did and has largely lost all of that investment. Now, and Prague made a good point uh, on your podcast uh, that there's a huge amount of value that was produced from that yeah. and will get to root the benefits. <laughs> the VCs subsidize it all, essentially. Nice. Uh, so that's nice for us, not so nice for them. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I still think that tech is going to see the light of day on road. I just think it's going to be a little longer than we all thought it was going to be. It's, first. I mean, it's it's already there. Yeah. Right. I I go on business trips and I get a rental car, and it's an economy rental car, right? It's not like Naya's paying for a souped-up rental car, so you know, we get the base <laughs> thing. Uh, but sometimes, you get a car that Lane keeps. And yeah. I'll sit there with my hands off the wheel. Usually I have my hands on the wheel because I know that they will fail. Yeah. Uh, and I know how they can fail. Um, oh, that's awesome. And I've had rental cars that have driven me on highway trips for, you know, 20 minutes at a time, 30 minutes at a time without an intervention, depending yeah. on the exact scenario. I that's did almost awesome. uh, crash once. I, I almost crashed a Tesla in the Bay Area. Yeah. I, uh, I didn't know it couldn't handle roundabouts. Uh, I might have told this story on the podcast, so if you've heard it, I'm sorry. But I didn't know it couldn't handle roundabouts. And um, <laughs> I, I was driving a guy's uh, Model X. Um, like, my Airbnb host was like, hey, you want to test drive a Model X? And I'm like, mm -hmm. sure, Raj, absolutely. Yeah, you know, yeah. I probably shouldn't have said his name, but that's what it was. Yeah. And um, we, uh, we got in, and you know, he just put out an autopilot, and he's like, yeah, just, dude, let it go. And I'm like, great. And so we're going in the car. Uh, I'm going up to a roundabout. And he's like, catch it, catch it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, catch yeah. it. And yeah. I kind of like grab the wheel. Like, Fuck. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah so. And that's kind of interesting. But like, cause... I feel like it's a customer education problem because, yep. you know, if, if they had said, you know, it's lane keeping and not that it's a self driving car, I would have known that. Yes. Yes. You know? Yeah. And that's, I think a lot of the first fieldings of autonomous systems are going to be exactly that, where you have to go through a customer education piece to say, yeah. this is where it works. This is where it won't. Don't try to do this. Yeah. And when you see this, insert yourself. Yeah. Help it. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure what it doesn't was, enter this failure mode. What was your almost crash in a self-driving car story? Or self-driving, uh, a lane change? It uh, was a merge. Car. So you got cut off? Or you were merging into... It was like a zipper merge. A lane okay. was ending. Yeah. And I was on autopilot. Yeah. Well, it was... Uh, um, Adaptive cruise control. Okay. That's all it was. I don't think it was even lane keeping. Yeah. Uh, and I got a little lax because it was, it was traffic and stopping me, whatever. 
and I didn't see someone merging and I like looked down for a second and looked up and I had to quickly break. I did not crash and it was probably I didn't crash either. It was probably more the uh, surprise, right? Yeah. That jarred me. Uh, so it, my reaction was probably uh, more than it needed to be given the situation. But you know that kind of scenario where you—it's like, better to, to over break than to hit yeah. a person. I mean, yeah, because you, know, yeah. you were too but it, lackluster. But it speaks to the fact that when you start to use some of these systems, and they've done research to show this for like the first, I think it's forty-five or sixty seconds that you take over one of these systems yeah. that has lane keeping or adaptive cruise control. Your whatever. adrenaline's through the roof. <laughs> no, you, your driving ability yeah. is the equivalent of a drunk driver. Oh, that's amazing. So I'm sure your adrenaline is also through the roof. Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah cuz it's it, especially if it's in a case where you're avoiding a collision. Yeah. Um but it it kind of lulls you to sleep a little bit cuz it's kind of natural cuz you're you're not active, right? Yeah. So if you're kind of bored sitting there, you kind of drift off, look around and I mean that's that's kind of how people Well, there is kind of a ritual when case. you start driving a car where like you kind of, you know, check the mirrors, get your bearings, you know, mm -hmm. you're like, okay, I'm entering into driving mode, you yep. know, and so. Yeah, and the act, you actively perceiving the environment is a very different state of mind than being driven. Yeah, for sure. So that context switch the research has shown is non-trivial and definitely not instant. Well, it's interesting too, because 40 to 60 seconds is not enough time to intervene. <laughs> yeah. And so you've got your, drunken you know equivalent self do you want another one uh yes please absolutely thank you uh but you've got your drunken equivalent self now responsible for you know a vehicle and the your lives of the people in the car you know mm -hmm. so that's interesting i've never heard that stat the the drunk driver analogy but that's interesting yeah and i don't know if i got the 45 to 60 seconds number yeah. right but the yeah. idea is there yeah i get it yeah yeah that is that is wild mm -hmm. So what's the workaround? Just better autonomy, more scoped in, better customer education. How do you not get lazy with a system that's designed to help you be able to get lazy? I mean, like that's that's the whole point, I would think, is to, to offload cognitive load. I mean. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I mean, they've started to do things that f try to force you to pay attention. Yeah. But like then doesn't that defeat the purpose? You. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so where's the user, utility? Yeah. Yeah. From a user experience, it is uh less value but yeah. i would still take a car that beeps at me if i don't put my hands on the wheel for a minute or 30 seconds yeah than a car that doesn't so it might lead to more sales and that's interesting if you field it you sell more cars you get more money to funnel into improving the capability and maybe it goes from every 30 seconds to every minute or maybe it knows when it sees a certain thing or maybe you have a a map of recorded interventions that you say, hey guys, take the wheel here because we know the system has failed repeatedly. I mean, that's not gonna work in the novel case, but I would say- But at least in sort of known edge cases, you can say this is likely to create problems, you mm -hmm. know, just exercise extreme diligence or yeah. increase it, like get your head on straight. I don't think it solves the problem, but I think yeah. it could potentially reduce real catastrophes, yeah. reduce the number of real catastrophes, which becomes an ethical question of, have you reduced the questions enough? Yeah. Or I mean, have the, you reduced the inc incidents enough? I guess the I guess I'm on your side a lot of ways, right? Because I, I was actually looking at cars recently and there's one I considered and one of the selling points for me was that it had a system that would point cameras at your face and mm -hmm. if you started to look down or like away, yeah. you know, because you're texting yeah. or whatever. Like it would start, you know, yeah. to pump the brakes and yep. flashlights at you and stuff. And yep. I thought that was kind of nifty, and I sort of wanted that in my car. But then on the other hand, you know, I feel like I've I know a lot of people that you know bought you know the you know Tesla or whatever, and and they think it's like, full self driving. Yeah, they they, they want they, they want to be able to take lap, their laptop and like yeah. get work done while they're while they're driving. Yeah, you know, and I so yeah. I mean. When I was using that adaptive cruise control, I knew the system could fail. Yeah. But I still found my head. That's interesting. Yeah. Because I'm not active. So yeah. it was just hard to stay awake. Yeah. Uh, so there was a real risk that I could have fallen asleep and I would have actually crashed. Yeah. Uh, and people are lulled into a false sense of security because it works in a lot of cases. Yeah. But they don't 
understand that it's not going to behave like a human. It's not going to fail in the well, same way. Well, also, you could, in theory, human. with one of those, fall asleep for half an hour, and like, yeah. you're going to eventually get to an edge case. Like, yep. I don't care, you know, like, eventually you're going to hit, you know, like the highway's going to end, something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, yep. yeah. You, you're going to hit an edge case. You're rolling the, the dice, right? Yeah. At some the point, gear's it's going to walk out. Something's going to happen. Yeah. 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 And so. I would say, as an autonomy developer, I'd probably want to leverage shadow-like features as often as shadow -like? possible. Shadow-like? I think it was Tesla that talked about their shadow uh, system, which is you are running the unstable version of your stack on the vehicle. It's not actively controlling the vehicle, but it is running, and you're trying to evaluate how well would these changes perform. Oh, interesting. So you could have a fully manual car, and in shadow mode, you have your stack running in the background. It's not going to actually turn the wheel, but it's going to say, here's how I would turn the wheel yeah. if I were in control. And you could slowly make that better over time without well, actually putting people in danger. Now, that means you're not providing value to the consumer immediately. No. So you're not going to help... Sales well, there's not that so, many companies I would think that would be willing to install all that intelligence in their vehicle if it's yeah. not creating a value add or you know increasing their sales potential of that product. Yep. Yeah. So it, it hurts the profit line, yeah. right? Because you can't really sell more cars with a shadow mode. Yeah. But you might be able to find the pieces that are high reliable and not going to risk lulling people to sleep like lane keeping. Yeah. Right. If you have, and I have a uh, lane departure warning on my car. I think that's a phenomenal example of an MVP yeah. that is an incremental step towards autonomy. So yeah. if I start drifting over, my steering wheel shakes. That's awesome. That's brilliant. It, if it fails, okay, great. So my steering wheel shook, and I can probably tell, and I'm actively engaged in the act of. Driving. I have uh, with blind spot monitoring, which I feel like yeah. is very similar. You're like, okay, well, you know. If one of these lights on my fucking rearview mirror doesn't light up, I mean, I still, I'm not stupid. Yeah. Like, I've driven cars without these for years. Yeah. And I have yeah. uh, advanced collision warning. So if my car thinks it's going to hit something, it'll go beep, 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 and a light will flash. That's interesting. And that behavior is not very good. I've gotten false positives. Oh, I, I mean, Does when it you, ever hit the brakes for you? Because I've, no. I've been in cars it's that warning. do that. That's, warning that's, only. That's cool. So the the warning pieces are an easy sell because yeah. they're not actually a, a, engaging a yeah. brake or a throttle or steering wheel. That probably reduces the liability, I would think, too, on the part of the they're manufacturer. They're just giving you an indication yeah. via lights, via haptics, uh, yeah. via sound. Um, you're going to hit the line, right? The border to which you can provide value with those capabilities at some point. Yeah. But that's it still provides value and yeah. there's no risk. Yeah. Uh, unless maybe the sound, you know, scares you and you end up steering yeah. off the road. One thing that was kind of funny is I I had a bunch of rental cars um, like when I uh, when I destroyed my last car and I started looking for a new one that had um, braking when they would detect an obstacle in front. And so there was one like Mitsubishi I rented in particular that would do that. Mm -hmm. And I park in a carport that I've got like a tarp that I let down. Yeah. And so it looks like an impassable obstacle to the car. Yep. And so I would, I you know, I go to hit it and it like breaks. I'm like, no, I want to, I want to go yeah. through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's vegetation. And that's funny because I mean, there is some potential danger to actively breaking, right? Um, yeah. It could be jarring. It depends. Yeah. I I, uh, I remember a friend's car I was in in college, I think, that had that automatic collision braking. Uh, and the garage door was opening. <laughs> and she tried to drive in. And it uh, like threw on the emergency brakes and jarred the car to stop, even though like the door was opening and she was moving like right under it. Uh, but yeah, so those kind of failure modes. I wonder what their sensor was for that though, that it saw the door if it was that far up. I think it was radar. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That'd be my first guess. This was a number of years ago, so. Uh, yeah, I'm they started, I think those came on the scene like around 2014 or so, like the ESRs. That should be right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but. The moral of the story is find the MVPs, provide value, and on the on-road driving space, 
try not to put people's lives at risk. But that's the whole ethical question of how much risk are you willing to take? And, you know, at some point, uh, hopefully we'll get the cars that are safer than people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, eventually, you know. Mm -hmm. The other interesting point is like, you know, to what extent are you trying to compete with a bus if you're doing a self-driving car, you know, because really it's just a transit if you're a robo-taxi. But... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to see, you know, Jetson-style speed uh, where you have flying cars, cars flying by like 150 miles per hour, zippering in and out of each other. Like Back uh, to the Future too. Solving traffic, yeah, that would be fantastic. But we're a long, yeah, that would long be awesome. Ways away from that, yeah, yeah, that would that would be sweet. I would, uh, I would definitely get excited about that. Mm -hmm. yep. But we at least we have like a quad rotor, like taxi in Dubai or whatever. <laughs> sure. Well, air. If there's enough, if you're operating the right airspace, yeah, air travel can be trivialized. Right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's been productized yet. I think that was just like at a trade show. That that was, yeah, the yeah. second you start trying to go through like a forest. Well, and also the other thing is if you're in city airspace and that thing suffers a failure, like yep. you're, you're you're going down. Yeah, and, and if you try to use that in a city, presumably you're going to have more than one, and you've got skyscraper buildings that you're you might not fly all the way above that starts to be a really hard problem because now you've got to actually do odla obstacle detection obstacle avoidance but if you're in free airspace flying yeah it's literally empty space yeah you don't have to you just fly straight yeah so in that respect uh that kind of autonomy you, is much simpler have you looked at zipline yet yeah yeah what yeah. do you think uh i think it's awesome i agree i love that the starting point was a medical application in rwanda i believe that... you saw the mark rober video yes nice <laughs> I just yeah watched i mean, it too. i i love that i there i remember yeah. uh, one guy in that video said something to the effect of uh i think he himself was saved by a bag of blood that the zipline drones had flown to a hospital yep uh and he made the statement every time i look up in the sky and see a drone I think of a life being saved, and like I yeah. literally like got a tear in my eye. Yeah, like, it I was think beautiful. So too. Yeah, I, that's my dream. Happy. Like it, it would be so meaningful to have that kind of impact on society. So that's my dream for yeah, these for sure. Vehicles. Well, it's cool to see those guys scaling too, because it seems like they're I don't know how many countries yeah. they're in now, but they said in that video, and, and their new technology yet. with that you know the little droid thing. That's like, a smart the, idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's, it's, it's uh, clever. Yeah, it's a, a deployment through a zip line. Yeah. So you uh, change the requirements of well, the it, drone. It's a massive systems engineering like yeah. effort, right? I mean, like when you think about what it must have taken to figure all that stuff out and all the different pieces that have to work for that to go. I mean, yeah. it's it's kind of awesome that they made it work at all. Yeah. And so I I don't know. I'm I'm definitely a fan, and uh, you know, it's it's interesting to see those guys gaining traction. I mean, and we'll see how it does in commercial, but I, I think they're probably going to do all right. Like, yeah. you know, where, like, Amazon tried to do that and, like, they couldn't because they... Yeah. I think it's because the tech wasn't there yet. I think it's because when they attempted to do it Prime now, like, we just didn't have, like... Well, they tried to do it with true... Quads. Quarters. Yeah. So Zipline is innovating with respect to the actual... Well, their propeller vehicle. design is different, right? I mean, there's a few different innovations they've had, so, like... Well, but it's the fact that it's dropping a... Yeah. But, um, I mean, the, like the, the ones... Almost that... unidimensional second it must drone. have a rudder like it's got to be able yeah. to control itself in, yeah. in two degrees of freedom yes otherwise that wouldn't work well and the third degree would be the zip one. Oh yeah that's true yeah but that's well i guess it's a full system i was gonna say that's the big vehicle yeah. but you're right but they've got the big vehicle that's doing the bulk of the work and eliminating the requirement for that to have precise positioning yeah and doing this clever system well i also love like the noise mitigation by having that up in the sky and that yeah like, yeah. It lowering this little thing down, it's just bloop. <laughs> yeah, I the thing that's great for Zipline is they've got their base capability which has literally saved lives. Yeah. Lives, it's beautiful and is That one I doesn't have probably. the little drone though. I don't know if you've no, seen that. I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, of course. Yeah, they've got the little parachutes. Yep. And then I love how like janky the parachutes are with yeah. the guy like boop. Yeah, yeah. And you can see the lady wrapping the uh, the blood in the video. She's like six wraps. Yeah. <laughs> it felt harder than I first expected. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I noticed too. And so that 
that to me was like kind of well it's what you talked about with an mvp it's like well, they didn't need a complicated parachute system because yeah. they found that you know if they just wrap the blood more, yep, you know they can they can land safe. Yeah, and, and I, pop it. I'm not convinced that the zipline system is going to be fielded anytime soon. I'm sure it at least needs five to ten years of development. Yeah, but if they've right. got the base product and, like you said, are bringing that to other countries, I guess the disadvantage in their yeah. business model is that you'd assume that it requires. Uh, I also like wonder not first world countries. Yeah, so that limits your customer base. But I mean, if you're wait in terms of their original business model with the, the original. Oh yeah, 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 the original. Like the point I'm trying to make is that that's an MVP. It's profitable, uh, but you are limited to some respect. But there's still huge amounts of countries all over the world that don't have first world infrastructure to fly blood to every hospital, right? Yeah. So I I don't see their value proposition going away anytime soon. I don't know exactly what kind of uh, revenue streams they're pulling in. Yeah. But it's probably pretty decent and it's probably yeah. enough that they can continue to invest in the zipline piece. I also thought their propeller design was really interesting. I don't know if that's unique to them. I suspect it is, mm -hmm. but did you see that with like the two props like hanging off and then they had a counterweight on the other side? No, I didn't. And then the idea was like the acoustic signature is reduced because of just the like the way that they've phase shifted the props against each other. Like it like mm. causes turbulence with its own sound. Nice. And so it's yeah, yeah no, it was it was, so it was clever. Like I, I I'm probably getting the science a little wrong, but. The, did the Mark Gruber video just come out? Because I just yeah. watched this like a couple days it, ago. It, it did just come out. Okay. I just watched I, it. But he shows that he shows the prop design and like I got halfway through. Oh, I got so you. I still need to finish the second half of the I'm video. Sorry, so that's I didn't probably spoil the second half. No, that's great. Yeah. I, now I'm motivated again to go back and finish it. Yeah. Because I think it was like eleven thirty at night. And I needed to stop. Yeah. It was. It was amazing though, because like the it just the noise of it is like so much lower than a conventional drone because of because of those props. Mm -hmm. So like that's that's also like a huge you know just people wanting to be around this thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the real uh, the real task in front of the off road autonomy developers are to find sorry. that <laughs> to find that same thing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's not an easy task. Yeah. So that's what I'll be looking for. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But everybody wants the full autonomy. Everyone, everyone wants it to do everything. And so there's a bit of a negotiation that has to happen. Yeah, it makes sense to me. We, we have to negotiate scope all the time on projects. It sounds like you're negotiating what yeah. the product vision should be. Yeah. You know, and, and that makes sense to me. Yep. Yeah. When you say everyone wants full autonomy, like who are the stakeholders that are pushing for that? Just the public? Every, every, yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> every industry I've ever worked in with respect to robotics. Military, mining, construction, agriculture, um, indoor robotics, yeah. uh, inventory management. I mean, who wouldn't want full autonomy? Yeah, like, yeah. it's like it's, it's a work perfectly. Yeah, sure. everybody wants it to work perfectly, and there's definitely a lot of hype. Yeah, and marketing done, especially with AI ML. Yeah, I strongly dislike the use of the term AI. Yeah, I feel like it's over any product that currently overblown. exists. Yeah, I I don't think there, I don't think artificial intelligence exists yet. Yeah, maybe if it does, it's some of the work that's been done in universities for uh, systems that claim to be as smart as, uh, like a young child. Oh, interesting. Um, but most of the time when people say AI, they're talking about Chet what GPT. I would call ML. <laughs> what, sorry, what was your? It's name? a Chat GPT. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like ChatGPT is hilarious. Yeah. I actually, uh, I kind of love it. Like it's, yeah. I asked my girlfriend to generate a mock patient profile, <laughs> and I said I want to take your mock patient profile and see if I can feed it to Chat ChatGPT and get it to tell me what to do. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I just reiterated whatever she said because I don't know medicine. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there was like seven things wrong with this patient. And chat GPT listed out seven things and said, for this, I would do this, for this, I would do this, for this, I would do this. And every single one of those things independently was reasonable. Yeah. But she said, if you did all of those things at once, you would kill the person. <laughs> <laughs> so like chat GPT in my mental model 
is essentially this astounding ability to uh, consolidate, you know, what was it, the whole internet up to 2021 or something? Something like that. Uh, into a single equivalent of a Google search bar, right? Yeah. Uh, it's like a really cool Google search bar. Yeah. Uh, and you have no idea if what it's going to tell you is correct. Well, that's the thing, right? Like, I've noticed it seems plausible, but then, like, I, I want to see how it acts in domains that I know about. Yeah. Because I feel like that's where you start to notice gaps. Yeah. It's And, and I, I've done that with off-road autonomy. But yeah. it, it basically regurgitates what people have said. Yeah. And the, um, the breadth of information it can regurgitate is absolutely astounding. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just an incredible ability for information encoding. Yeah. Right. Uh, but when I ask it about some of the problems that I work on, because I was like, well, hey, maybe this thing can solve <laughs> for me. Uh, and it just gives you uh, like the most trivial answers. It doesn't yeah. actually say anything meaningful. When yeah, I I've noticed it, that. How do I process LIDAR data to detect a negative hazard? Blah, 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 blah. blah right. Uh, you could do something like that. And it just it doesn't really tell you anything interesting. It kind of restates the problem and then says some general concepts, which are like, yeah, like the first that things. would apply to LIDAR in any case. Yeah. Yeah. So it's fun. Uh, I yeah. I did just use it. Uh, That's kind of what it's been for me so far as a party trick. Like I've not yes. used it at work. Yes. It's I know a lot of people trick. are. I've, I've, I've thought okay, about using so, it to generate job descriptions or like bones for like you yep. know, yeah. business plans yeah. and stuff like, like a, that. But. To write an abstract. Yeah. I feel like it would be really good if you could give it an academic paper and say generate an abstract for me. Yeah, it might be really good at that. Yeah, I could see um, that. Or a summary. Yeah. Um, or like a paragraph, a marketing paragraph. The one I heard about today that was kind of funny is like somebody was doing a customer service thing, and it they got it to like deal with a difficult customer, like where they got it to write the return email, mm -hmm. and it saved like half an hour of work and nice. like you know having to think through like how yeah. to dance around eggshells yeah. around this person. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, there's. It is uh, kind of funny with like kids' stories too, like getting it to like write, like you know I. Kind of my joke that I'll do is I'll like I'll make it <laughs> probably somewhat inappropriate, but I'll say it anyway. So like I got it to write like a love story about two people I work with just as a gag, okay. <laughs> and I'm like and I I set it in in the in one of the locations that we were working in, and I was like set it in this location, yeah. And write well, it about this, are... and it's hilarious, and you know you're just yeah. like hey, you know, nice, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. People are uh, <laughs> making courses now for how to write good chat GPT prompts. So there's an art to that as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's fun. Oh, I, I was going to say, I uh, I think I just used it today to try and come up with names for a product. Because that's nice. that's one of my like least favorite things to do is try to name things. Is it good Although, at that? I feel like it gave me three decent answers that like, nice. started to give me some ideas. That's awesome. So... It was useful for that, for kind of like seeding some uh, product names, uh, which is funny because I strongly dislike trying to name a product like the marketing spiel, but something I'm very passionate about is the semantic names of variables in code. Oh, that's interesting. So that I have had conversations with a lot of engineers at NAIA saying that like a lot of people when they're coding will kind of just like, you know, throw something at the wall and see what sticks with respect to variable names. Yeah, a lot of them are lazy. Well, a lot of people have different philosophies on it. And then when you start to talk about it, I feel like good ideas come out. But yes, like, and it's, it's you also that You have to kind of get together and... It's yeah. also that... It's it's not necessarily that they're lazy. That does happen. But it's also some, sometimes simply the fact that they to them it's it. clear. Yeah. But what they haven't taken a second to think about is, it's clear to me, but what is someone else going to think about when they read this? Yeah. And so I find it very useful when I name a variable or a class or whatever to try and think, how can I make this as unambiguous as possible? Uh, and I am a big proponent of if you need to make the variable name longer so you can resolve ambiguity. Yeah. I, there's... Well, I learned to code in Java first. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my philosophy as well. Yeah. yeah. And I, I've just seen so many cases where People have wasted, I shouldn't say wasted time, people have gotten stuck because they read a variable name, interpreted it one way, 
And then it took them eight hours to figure out that's not what it meant. Oh. And then they had to trace the code and be like, oh, that's what it means. Okay. Whereas you could have just, uh, instead of naming something Vel. Vel. Velocity. Yeah. You could have said, like, uh, angular, angular velocity about tire. You know what I mean? Like, oh, nice. Which I, oh, I just thought this was the linear ve velocity of the vehicle. Oh, right? I gotcha. Like, just things like that. I don't know that that's yeah. the best example, but hopefully you get the idea. Yeah, yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tire angular velocity would work. Angular velocity yep. about tire. That's way Actually, more uh, one of the examples that comes to mind that is relevant is uh, steering wheel angle. Yeah. versus road wheel angle oh versus that's angular interesting velocities yeah yeah those those always get mixed up steering wheel with, angle versus road wheel yeah i like that with so a lot wheel of transforms angle. Yeah. too you've got transforms going from uh you know the vehicle's body frame or base link frame and ross uh to s different sensor frames to you see that in systems engineering to too yeah like resolving like, ambiguity pays a lot of dividends yeah uh, because it's easier to debug it's easier for new people to come in and understand debug and extend yeah. capability so i i think it's very important yeah i agree and i'll go a step further and say it's also important with terms and systems engineering yeah yeah, yeah. but product names i don't want to deal with i'm yeah. so bad at it yeah. <laughs> we kind of had a, a gag with him not great with him either uh, i don't know if a gag is the right phrase but we kind of had a short circuit naming scheme, which is put UX in front of everything. <laughs> <laughs> Just call it a day. So uh, we have the the vehicle that I built up yeah. as an intern, that John Deere Gator, yeah. was called the UX Interceptor. And then the first- UX Interceptor? Yeah, the UX Interceptor. So you, Interceptor is what John Deere called the original product. No, it was a Gator. Yeah. I don't remember where Interceptor came from. Because I feel like Interceptor on its own sounds cool. Yeah, it was. It's because it was like a UGV, so it was going to yeah. intercept, right? Yeah. Um, but you see UXV a lot for mm -hmm. uh, a wild card that could mean ground, air, surface, subsea. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't, so, I haven't heard that. That's cool. So internally, uh, you know, we referred to it as the UX interceptor, and then mm -hmm. the first skid steer platform we got was a Max platform, so we called it the UX Max. And the unmanned, I don't know what interceptor. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then like there's a, a standard architecture called UCS and we wrote an SDK for it to like generate code that adhered to the standard for this uh, unmanned control segment something architecture. I didn't work that piece, so I don't know the details, but we call that SDK UX UCS. <laughs> which is like, Wait, what does so, UCS stand for? I think it's unmanned control segment. Got it. Okay. Something like that. I, yeah. I don't recall exactly. Yeah. But uh, it was. It speaks to the fact that engineers like me. If I say OCU, do, does do that other. does that ring a bell to you? OCU, yeah, operator control. Unit. Ah, crap. Okay, I was hoping. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Andrew, thanks for coming on. I had a really great time here. Uh, is there anything you want to plug? Uh, I will say Naya is hiring. Nice. Uh, and so I've already talked about all the cool projects we work on, like negative obstacle detection, vegetation filtering. Over all the vehicles. Yeah, over all the vehicles, on land, through the surf zone, autonomous demolition, all that stuff. So if, if that stuff sounds exciting to you, then uh, go to our website, nanorobotics.com. And uh, we need more people because we're growing more than ever. Uh, and so we've got more, more cool projects nice. than ever. Yeah, and if they're on the autonomy team, they can work with you. So. Well, I mean... It is a company that focuses on off-road autonomy. Oh, okay. So it's pretty much the whole company. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, pleasure having you on. Thanks Likewise. On, and uh, I'll see you on the next one. All righty. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.